agree, but where we disagree on our different priorities, we will have our own voice and own ability to secure a good deal for Scotland's fishermen. Thank you very much. And that concludes portfolio questions for this afternoon. Point of order, Mr MacArthur. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. On a point of order, you will know that the agenda this afternoon includes a statement uh, from Mr Russell on innovation centres. Uh, you will also see uh, this morning that the Cabinet Secretary invited the media to accompany him uh, on a visit to Inchinnan, where he made a number of announcements concerning innovation centres. I have the report from the uh, Scotsman here. Uh, President Officer, you and your predecessors have frequently taken a strong line with ministers who choose to make announcements to the media rather than to Parliament. You rightly consider it a discourtesy to inform Parliament only after the media has been informed. Is this not an occasion where Parliament can take the Cabinet Secretary's uh, remarks as read uh, and move on to other business? And if you are concerned that this might leave a gap in our programme this afternoon, could I also suggest that you could invite the First Minister to come to the Chamber later on to make a statement on his currency mystery that has deepened overnight with the remarks from uh, Coffer Beveridge, uh, which have largely hung the First Minister out to dry on this issue. Thank you very much. Mr MacArthur, the presiding officers have looked into this matter following representations from opposition parties. As presiding officers have said repeatedly, the government must be very careful when pre-releasing any details of announcements that are subsequently to be made to Parliament. The presiding officers have studied the statement carefully and are satisfied that, on balance, since the full details of the statement are not contained in the media release and therefore members should hear directly from the Cabinet Secretary and then have the ability to question him. However, before making the statement, I remind the Scottish Government of the importance of making announcements to Parliament before placing the details in the public domain. And we now move to that statement, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, and I make it plain that the burden of this statement is not uh, connected to the announcement of £14 million. And I do accept that perhaps the, the, that announcement should have been made on a different occasion. The burden of this statement, however, is quite different, and I'm sure members will look forward to hearing of it. Presiding officer, this is actually my first opportunity to brief members on the significant economic impact of the ambitious and groundbreaking programme, which is Innovation Centres, and I welcome the chance to do that. Developed in partnership with the Scottish Funding Council, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, innovation centres are collaborations between universities, businesses and others to enhance innovation in and across Scotland's key economic sectors. When launched, this initiative was widely welcomed as having the potential to greatly improve university business engagement by bringing together those best able to resolve many of the challenges facing industry in Scotland whilst har harnessing many new opportunities. And I now want to share with the Parliament some indications of positive progress and what we are beginning to expect in terms of impact from such a significant investment. Presiding officers, you know Scotland has five universities in the world's top 200, more than any other country per head of population. We have a track record of securing competitive research with funding from a range of sources reflecting the excellence and global reputation of our universities. Our universities excel when it comes to research with more citations than any other country in comparison to GDP. We are disproportionately excellent at what we do. And this government has shown its support for our universities and research through investments such as the Global Excellence Initiative. And in an independent Scotland, we can and will do even more. Our universities and research facilities are a core strength in our economy. They're also an important growth sector. That's why we sought to help improve the links between our universities and public and private sectors, increasing the economic and social benefits of innovation. And we start from sound foundations. Our research pools, for example, and we were the first country to develop such a strategy, have embedded a collaborative approach across the university sector to provide a critical mass of research experience which enhances our competitiveness on the world stage. And this has been instrumental in attracting international research centres to Scotland, such as the Fraunhofer Centre for Applied Photonics and the first Max Planck International Partnership in the UK. That's why a British Council report recently pointed to a joined-up and collaborative sector helped by its modest size and the Scottish ethos of education as a public good as one of the five strategic assets of Scottish higher education. But we're always ambitious to do more. And Innovation Scotland epitomises our approach. Launched last October, it gives focus and impetus to improving the effectiveness of universities and businesses working together, increasing innovation in the economy. 
That approach is assisting in developing collaborative approaches to spin-out support, supporting easy access IP, and extending the role of interface to better facilitate business and academic partnerships. And Innovation Centre's presiding officer are a manifestation of that approach in action. While research pooling was about improving the quality of our research through collaboration across the university sector, innovation centres build on that research quality and collaborative strength by promoting innovation in a commercial context. Innovation centres are large-scale, ambitious projects of excellence. They're about developing the best environment for business and academia to interact, taking innovation to another level. They're part of a cultural shift that brings the innovation and creativity of our academic sector to the heart of our business life and puts business drive firmly into the heart of our academic sector. These centres help the research community understand the needs of their particular industry and they help industry understand the assistance that can be delivered through research. Scottish Government investment in the overall programme is substantial through the Scottish Funding Council providing up to £124 million over a six-year period. About £18 million of this is already committed and the first eight innovation centres, including £2 million for MSc places to improve the connections between businesses and universities, are all underway. And this morning, as has been indicated, I announced £14 million from within the £124 million that will support major capital and infrastructure investment across the programme. If I can take just one example in the Stratified Medicine Scotland Innovation Centre, which I visited this morning, it will receive £4 million to help secure NHS data sets and establish a next generation uh, genomic sequencing platform at its interim facility at Ch in, in Chinon. But we're under no illusion that these are large scale ventures that will need time and patience for their potential to be fully realised. The public investment we're making is being more than matched by the Innovation Centre partners, who estimate their contribution to be around 200 million cash and in kind, reflecting the strong support from industry, who recognise the potential ambition of this programme. Those partners all come with high expectations and high reputations. They time precludes me from naming them all. But, for example, GlaxoSmithKline, Thales UK, Armour Group, Philips HealthGo, Cisco Systems, Thermo Fisher, where I was this morning, and Ardiha Informatics, and there are many others. And they're not only global players. Uh, SMEs are taking an active part. And indeed, there are, there are strong plans to make sure that these innovation centres are incubators for new activity. Now, the first phase was launched last year with the Digital Health Institute, Stratified Medicine and Sensors and Imaging Systems. Since then, two further centres have been launched, Industrial Biotech and Aquaculture, and later this year we're going to see innovation centres covering oil and gas, big data and construction. And they've began, begun to make their mark on the landscape. We shouldn't underestimate the benefits the centres will bring to the people of Scotland and wider society. Stratified Medicine is recognised as a future for the diagnosis and treatment of disease. Tailoring treatment to those who will benefit most increases cost effectiveness. In effect, it's getting the right drug to the right person at the right time. But the real burden of this statement is about what is happening now across the innovation centre landscape. We are seeing advances in skills, processes, collaboration, performance, leading to a significant longer-term impact on our economy. And I can announce to Parliament today the first indication of the scale of that economic impact coming from the innovation centre programme. Based upon the business plans for individual centres, the cumulative boost to the Scottish economy could reach a massive 1.5 billion and create up to 5,000 jobs across the wider economy. And these figures reveal the impact that our world-class higher education sector, working in partnership with business, can deliver. More jobs, better jobs, and a stronger economy. And the figures illustrate the scale of the economic potential. We're now working on a comprehensive baseline economic impact assessment so we can fully monitor and evaluate the success of the innovation centres as they all come on stream. And that's going to confirm the considerable impact of this strategy. And there are opportunities, as we're now witnessing, for the innovation centres themselves to stimulate productive new collaborations. For example, Stratified Medicine is already talking about working with big data. And the University of Edinburgh is leading on a bid to secure the Knowledge Innovation Centre on Activity and Healthy Ageing from the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. And the aim of that is to develop new health and care goods and services with business and economic models that enable systemic change. And the innovation centres will play a role in strengthening the bid. It's a truly collaborative bid, with expert partners from Scotland, the international commercial community, and other parts of Europe working together to secure the project. We're supporting that and we wish the bid team every success. 
We believe we have now a community of innovation across Scotland in a strong position for attracting EU investment. Indeed, some of the innovation centres are now talking with SDI about their connection to the wider international community. We are maximising, presiding officer, the potential of university business collaboration to support innovation and economic growth. But there's more we could do. Independence can reinforce our global approach by providing access to more of the policy levers required to support innovation, including key financial tools. For example, Reindustrialising Scotland for the 21st Century, published in June, highlighted how, with independence, future Scottish governments would be able to develop an overarching framework which aligns innovation and activity and considers new opportunities supporting innovation. These could be through tax incentives, such as allowances and R&D expenditure, our reductions in payroll taxes for employees directly involved in research and development, such as presently takes place in the Netherlands. Independence would also allow us to better support a thriving, internationally connected and competitive university sector through the removal of a damaging immigration policy that often prevents our universities from attracting and retaining talented researchers. Our priority must be the reintroduction of the post-study visa, which will attract the best researchers from across the world to work in Scotland. Presiding officer, in conclusion, these innovation centres represent a major step forward in university business engagement. They bring with them the opportunity for a wide range of social and economic benefits to Scotland. We can now begin to quantify these, and I hope they'll be welcomed by the whole chamber. This is an initiative which we should all support. The ambition and vision of the Innovation Centre programme is remarkable. I hope the whole chamber will wish the partners every success over the coming months, years, and decades as we work together to ensure an innovative, collaborative, independent Scotland. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, but we are tight for time this afternoon, and therefore, if members are not succinct, unfortunately, that will eat into other members' ability to ask questions. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask questions could uh, press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Neil Bibby. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement. Uh, I welcome the investment in innovation centres and welcome the fact that he visited such a centre in Renfrewshire this morning, which will receive £4 million. Uh, pounds. I praise the work of industry and our universities. It just goes to show that the Scottish Government has significant powers to help improve education and the economy right now and what can be done when the Government works closely with industry and our universities. The Cabinet Secretary acknowledged in his statement that he is not announcing any additional money for innovation centres today, despite his press release this morning suggesting the opposite. We have known the figure of £124 million over six years for many months. The Cabinet Secretary, in his statement, also said we are disproportionately excellent at what we do in relation to university research and funding, and he is absolutely uh, right about that. Does he accept the fact, therefore, that in 2012-13, Scottish universities received £257 million, that's 13.1 per cent of UK research funding, significantly more than our 8 per cent share of UK GDP, or 8.4 per cent of the UK population? That is not to mention the 13 per cent of £1.1 billion, again above average funding, that our institutions received from UK charities. He also mentioned uh, attracting international investment. Does he not accept that we benefit from having 270 UK embassies right across the world helping to sell our universities and our industry? How many embassies would an independent Scotland have? Mr. Bibby, Finally, over time. Does he not accept, as much as he tries to reassure, as much as he tries to Order, reassure please. industry? and universities that the real threat to research and development funding in Scotland is his plan to separate from the rest of the United Kingdom. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, uh, there was little surprising in that question, though I am grateful that uh, Mr Bibby has welcomed the investments being made and the excellent work that's being done uh, in Inchin and across the country. Uh, can I pay tribute, Presiding Officer, to the work of Academics for Yes, who have very successfully, very success well, I am sorry that Labour members jeer, it does not become them, I have to Order, say. Order, please. Um, I'd like to pay tribute to the work of Academics for Yes because they've managed to, they've managed to uh, illustrate very strongly that far from being 
Presiding officer, I'm sorry, I'm just Cabinet trying to... If anyone jeers in the Parliament, I will deal with it. Please Thank continue you. and answer the question. Thank you very much. Uh, I do hope that academic, the work of academics for YES will be taken on board by those who are making so much noise, because what they've illustrated very, very clearly and proved very clearly is that academics with real ambition know that independence will work for them. It will allow them to go out into the world. It will allow them to sell their excellence, because the decisions on what is funded but in research comes because things are excellent. Mm -hmm. It is not a charitable action by research councils or anybody else. We have the best in the world. And that's not going to diminish the day after independence. The power of independence will allow universities to be sold throughout the world as Scottish universities. Very often, they ha their light is hidden under a UK bushel, and it's not done very effectively by some of the embassies that I have worked with in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I'm delighted at the prospect of our academics going out into the world and doing what they do well. And I would just urge Mr Bibby to be ambitious and confident, yeah. as Scottish universities yeah. are. Lady Scanlon. And I long for the day that we can do what we do well, and that's to debate the issues important to people in Scotland rather than independence. However, Scottish Conservatives thank the Scottish Government for the advance notice of this statement issued to the media at 0600 hours this morning. Uh, we welcome the 14 million capital of the 124 million already announced uh, for Scotland's innovation centres to improve collaboration and in innovation between industry, universities and across our key economic sectors. This is a mark of the success of devolved decision-making in Scotland within a United Kingdom and very welcome for new treatments of disease to sustainable food and more energy-efficient homes. All very welcome. My question, presiding officer, is given that further education has not been mentioned either in this morning's government press release or in the statement we've just heard, can I ask if people in further education will be given equal access to these opportunities as well as our universities? Cabinet Secretary. I think it is a good question, but let me just uh, reassure the member. The statement is not about £14 million. I think that's well accepted. The statement is about, the figure I used myself, was £1.5 billion, which this uh, programme of innovation centres is anticipated uh, to, uh, to uh, boost the Scottish economy. So uh, she should think big, not small. £14 million frees up further potential. £1.5 billion is the potential that's being freed up. In terms of further education, it's a very opposite question on this day, the day in which we complete the reform programme which we started three years ago. Uh, and indeed, I was present this morning, having been to Ishin, and I then went to uh, uh, Livingston to the Further Education Strategic Forum. And there I talked with many, many people about the opportunities that exist and the excitement that exists now in the sector of being reformed and focused on delivery. And indeed, the question she asks is one I discussed with the chairman of the uh, Scottish Funding Council uh, during the morning. And of course, there will be many opportunities for people across education. But I would encourage the member to think about education as a joined up process, not a divided process. Further education and higher education are now very close together and sometimes indistinguishable. And it's important that all members of this chamber caught up with that. Thank you, George Adam. Presiding officer, uh, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's statement, its ambition and vision for Scotland's future. And can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the innovation centres represent a massive step forward, bringing the academic and business worlds together, providing collaboration and innovation across both sectors? And does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the strength of Scotland's higher education sector is one of the reasons Scotland can approach independence with full confidence? Cabinet Secretary. I think the member is as ever absolutely right. The, uh, the situation is that the higher education sector is world-beating. We have the best higher education sector in the world. Now, we've heard voices from the Labour benches particularly that want to run that down, that want to diminish it, that want to uh, actually under-resource it. We've heard those all the time, and they can't get away from that fact. What Order, we need please. to do Order. is to continue to build and develop that sector Mr. as Bibby, well Order. as... Other... Mr Bibby, order, please. As to make sure that we build that sector and the wider educational sector so that we do get literally the best of both educational worlds. Jenny Mara. 
I think the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me that research underpins uh, innovation and our economy. Sir Philip Cohen is a world leading researcher who set up the life sciences industry in Dundee, which accounts for 18% of our local economy. What is the Cabinet Secretary's reaction to the statement in the published letter which Sir Philip Cohen signed, saying that the creation of a post independence common research area as an undertaking is fraught with difficulty and one that is unlikely? To come to well, I think Sir Philip Cohen has undertaken many things in his lifetime with fraught with difficulty and succeeded admirably, so I would urge him to continue with his confidence in his ambition. I would put into the balance alongside it a statement for Sir Tom Devine at the weekend, where Tom Devine looks... It's unusual for anybody to laugh at Sir Tom Devine. I find Jenny Atti Mara's attitude very strange. Sir Tom Devine, probably the leading historian in Scotland, a man much fated by the Labour Party, I have to say, including by Gordon Brown, has come to the conclusion that independence is the right thing for Scotland. So did, if she wishes to enter into the other worlds, Michael Attire, probably the leading mathematician in the world today. There are many, many academics who welcome the opportunities that independence will bring and really want to make it work. And I would urge Jenny Mara to get out there and work with the people of ambition and make sure that even those who have some doubts are able and encouraged to deliver for Scotland. Thank you. If questions and answers are more succinct, I might be able to call everyone. Otherwise, I definitely will not. Ailey MacLeod. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Well, I warmly welcome the Scottish Government's support for the Life Kickbid, which Edinburgh University is leading and the Digital Health Institute is a key partner. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this bid, if successful, offers considerable economic and social benefits to Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. I do. Uh, Dr MacLeod has uh, some experience with the university sector, and I know that she is familiar with the work that goes into these bids. And I am certainly of the view that the more we encourage that ambition from our universities across Scotland, uh, the greater success that we will have. Uh, of course, the, in, in Dumfries, where the, the, the member is a, a regional representative, there's considerable work being done on ageing and end-of-life care. And those things tie together. Further development of excellence in health and ageing in Edinburgh will help that work being done in Dumfries. So I think there's a, a, a tremendous opportunity for joining up work across Scotland. Thank you, Lee MacArthur. Very much. Uh, aside from the assertions around independence, can I very much agree with uh, the content of the Minister's statement and the, particularly the point around Scotland being disproportionately excellent in this area thanks to uh, collaboration. You will have seen the Wellcome Trust's uh, observation along those lines that differences in the regulations and governance systems that introduce additional burdens or that are perceived to be burdensome can restrict international collaborations and make countries less competitive. Does he agree with the Wellcome Trust? And if so, why is he determined to create borders in something which has its strength in being Cabinet Secretary. Well, the reality is that research knows no borders and works across borders, so that's not a problem for the Wellcome Trust. I think the Wellcome Trust and other trusts have been absolutely scrupulous in raising issues but not coming down on either side in this debate. Now, I've met a range of charities who support research, and all of them, without exception, have said, look, come and talk to us after the 19th of September. They will make things work because they know the excellence of Scottish research. And the problem for those people who are raising these barriers, uh, like the member, I'm afraid to say, is that they seem to lack confidence in the excellence of Scottish research. I have no such lack of confidence. Stuart McMillan. Uh, in the statement, the Cabinet Secretary spoke of the opportunities of independence as well as the economic and societal benefits. But the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Chief Executive of ESRC made clear in evidence to the Education Committee that subject to discussions on the details after the ES vote, they would support a single research area for Scotland and the rest of the UK. And does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this blows a hole in the no campaigns that scare stories on research funding? Cabinet Secretary. I think that uh, there are many things that blows, blow a hole in, in the case that's put by the No campaign because no, it has no merit to it whatsoever. Another thing that blows a hole in that is the reality of uh, research collaboration across Europe and the way in which research councils are working with other companies, countries and countries are opening up their research uh, funds to other countries for true collaboration. We are in a, a global, connected world of research. Scotland is in an enormously strong position in that place, and I think we should think big and be ambitious, uh, not try and hide away, as the No campaign would try us, uh, force us to do. Jane Baxter. Thank you. As the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, and Mary Scanlon has already made reference to this, colleges would welcome the opportunity to work more closely with the universities and industry on the skills agenda. And the Cabinet Secretary in his answer said that, that, that there was possibility to do that, but I'm wondering if there's scope 
to make that a more formal exercise to formalise the relationship between universities and colleges and also will there be funding made available to make that happen, especially in light of the Wood Commission recommendations? Cabinet Secretary. It is already happening. I mean, I'm very happy for the, to, to introduce the member to places where this is real. It's not theoretical. For example, uh, there are now five courses being offered jointly by the University of Stirling and Forth Valley College, in which people matriculate jointly in those institutions. So there are no barriers there. I met uh, two weeks ago some of the students from that in my, in my office, having visited Stirling University to see what they were, were doing. And all over the place, the barriers between further and higher education are breaking down. In reality, in further education now delivers between 20 and 25% of our higher education in Scotland. There are a huge range of opportunities. And what we must do is go with the flow on that and encourage more of it. We shall also have to encourage a great deal more online learning because online learning is undoubtedly where the future uh, lies, even for our institutions uh, that uh, teach in a conventional sense in Scotland at the present moment. So there's a huge number of exciting things happening. I'm really glad that the members engaged with this. I'd urge you to persuade our front bench to stop looking backwards and to start looking forwards at education. Stuart Maxwell. Uh, can I very much welcome this announcement and say I was delighted that the Cabinet Secretary visited the Stratified Medicine Scotland Innovation Centre in Inchinnan in the west of Scotland. But can the Cabinet Secretary outline what the potential economic impact will be of this particular innovation centre? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there are a, a, a range of opportunities that the centre is offering, and it is itself projecting a, a range of very, very positive outcomes. Um, I, Anna Domenicic, who is, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the head of the Department of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine uh, at, uh, at Glasgow University, uh, was present this morning uh, along with uh, a, those people who are uh, running the centre, including Mark Beggs, who is the CEO of the centre. And they went through with me the business plan that they have, uh, which projects estimated jobs created between three and 400, the additional uh, GVA estimated at £68 million. Pounds. But much more excitingly than the figures, they also went through the difference this will make in terms of individual lives. The work they are doing on oncology, the work they are doing, uh, for example, on uh, issues such as arthritis, which we discussed in some detail this morning, is tremendously exciting. And it shows that you can deliver the right drug at the right time to the right person in a way that will make a huge difference to the individual patient, a huge difference to the health service, and it will attract many, many people throughout the world to come and see what's happening here and to emulate it. So I think in every sense, the figures are undoubtedly good. The potential is even greater. Thank you. If we are brief, I might be able to call everyone. Ian Gray. Uh, the Innovation Centres are undoubtedly a welcome initiative, but they are very reminiscent of and identical in purpose to the Intermediary Technology Institutes launched back in 2002 with almost four times the budget even then. Uh, when the current government inherited the ITIs, they first slashed their budgets and then killed them off a couple of years later. So why does the Cabinet Secretary think that he can make this idea work second time around with a much smaller investment this time when they failed so badly before. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I wish the member had been with me this morning in Inchin and where you saw the enthusiasm, the commitment, the ideas. Even, even Ian Gray's doer approach to this would not have depressed, would not have depressed them. Now, I have to say there appears... Order, please. There, there, there appears to be... Ian Gray is, is, is the main exponent of a view that everything was wonderful under the previous administrations and it's all uh, gone to pot. Fortunately, that's not what the people of Scotland think. They actually think the reverse of that. They now look what was happening then and they realised how bad it was. Liz Smith. Sorry, thank you. Order, please. Uh, thank you. I think uh, Cabinet Secretaries are uh, warmly welcome in terms of the announcement today. I think uh, they are testimony to the excellence of the Scottish universities. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary one thing, however? Uh, what they're interested to know is how much extra money would be available for academic research under the subscription form of academic funding if Scotland was to be independent, as opposed to what they get with the United Kingdom. Cabinet Secretary. Well, they don't get it with the United Kingdom. That's, that's quite an important issue, uh, Presiding Officer. They get money from the Scottish um, uh, Government. They get money from the Research Councils, which is taxpayer-funded by ourselves as well. Of course, 8.8% of that money comes from ourselves. Um, and the reality is that they would not only continue to have access to that, but they would have a wider uh, world to play in, and they would be able to develop very positively their projection in that world. So I think the potential 
is great there. But I think it's wrong to see the research sector as simply beneficiaries from some UK largesse. Of course, Professor Brian McGregor in Academics for Yes points out the real danger is the cuts which are well known south of the border, which are eating into research funding south of the border, eating into science and technology south of the border, and as with health, will eventually have their effect in Scotland. And very briefly, Colin Beatty. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure us today that the Scottish Government's commitment to higher education will continue after a yes vote? Briefly, please, Cabinet Secretary. Yes, of course. Many thanks. That concludes this statement, and we now turn to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10829 in the name of Angela Constance on increasing opportunities for women. Could I invite those members who wish to participate in this debate to press the request to speak buttons? I will allow a few seconds for members to change seats. And I call on Angela Constance to speak to and to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, if you could do so in 13 minutes, I would be obliged. Thank you, President Officer. This government's ambition to secure sustainable economic growth has been consistent, and the current strength of our economy and labour market reflects the strength of our commitment to that ambition. Uh, women are key to the strength and resilience of Scotland's economy, and they have made a huge contribution uh, to the recovery we are now seeing. Uh, women work in every sector of Scottish industry, but too often they do so on an unequal basis. And as reports from the respected organisations such as the Fawcett Society show, uh, women are not feeling the same benefits, the same financial benefits of the recovery. And I and this government are determined uh, that women play the fullest possible role at all levels of our economy. And as they do so, I want to ensure that their valuable contribution is adequately rewarded. Because well-rewarded and sustained employment it can be the best route out of poverty and the best way to tackle inequality. And on Monday, I published Unlocking Scotland's Full Potential a clear statement on the great value we place on sharing our economic growth equally. And through equality of opportunity, we can create a more diverse workforce at all levels and at all areas in our economy, which maximises our skills, improves the productivity of our businesses and grows our economy at an even faster rate. President officer, we can deliver these ambitions because Scotland has great strengths and strong foundations from which to achieve progress. There are one and a quarter million women employed in Scotland, the highest number since comparable records began, and the female inactivity rate in Scotland is lower than anywhere in the UK. More young women than men stay on at school and are in higher and further education. And Scotland has the highest percentage of females with at least NVQ Level 3 qualifications in the UK. So it is therefore unacceptable that these strengths do not combine to create higher earnings for women in Scotland. Our gender pay gap remains unacceptably high at 7.6%. And when we look at how women earn 17% less than men when you take hourly medium earnings for full and part-time work together. We know that women's average earnings are lower, with men typically earning £90 a week more than women in full-time work. And the reasons are many, but in short, too many women continue to face occupational segregation, greater job insecurity, and higher levels of underemployment and pay inequality. And that is not the type of labour market which can deliver the more equitable share of economic growth, prosperity and opportunity that I believe Scotland must have. And the Strategic Group on Women and Work, which I chair, has, while engaging widely across the public and private sectors, played an important role in supporting our efforts to address these challenges. And our focus will be helped when in the autumn the Council of Economic Advisers published their report on maximising the economic potential of women in Scotland. However, the reality is this, that this government, with limited access to macroeconomic tools and legislative powers, is constrained in its ability to fully address these challenges. So instead of sharing the benefits of growth, maximising our talents and unlocking our potential, in Scotland today, too many households struggle to meet their bills as wages are eroded and the cost of living increases. 
Around half of working age adults and over half of children in poverty live in working households. And despite the UK Government's stated commitment to supporting families, women are disproportionately affected by its welfare reforms through changes to child benefit, working tax credit and loan payer and benefit conditionality. And this disparity will continue as universal credit is introduced. And these inequalities, I believe, presiding officer, create an inarguable case for Scotland becoming an independent country. And I believe that only independence can address these issues and create a Scotland which provides the opportunities to meet the ambitions of women. Too many women work in low-paid jobs, so the minimum wage impacts disproportionately on them. And we understand and we know the difficulties that this can create. And I believe that women deserve better. So with independence, the minimum wage will rise at least in line with inflation every year. If that had happened over the past five years, the lowest paid would have been £600 a year better off. And with responsibility for equalities legislation, we would address the scandalous inequalities in pay that persist despite the current system and 44 years of equal pay legislation. Independence will allow us to protect women from the worst effects of welfare reform. We will develop a welfare system which is fair, personal, simple and provides women with the same incentives to work as men. Current plans for universal credit mean that a higher level of partner's income will be taken into account as income when calculating the award. And in Scotland's future, we have committed to equalising the earnings disregard between first and second earners under universal credit. In doing so, it is estimated that second earners, more often women, would benefit as many as 70,000 people by as much as £1,200 a year. And of course, uh, this government under independence is committed to scrapping uh, universal credit. I want to see, presiding officer, women contributing to fully to the success of Scotland's businesses, its public and third sectors, and to the continued strengthening of Scottish economy. And I want to see that contribution benefiting women and their families equally. A lack of affordable, flexible childcare can be a significant barrier to many women accessing opportunities in employment, education or training. So we are investing over a quarter of a billion pounds in the next two years to expand provision for three and four year olds and will also extend this support to the most vulnerable and disadvantaged two-year-olds. The Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce rightly sets out an ambitious agenda to improve access to employment for young people. Together with local government, we are working to implement the report's recommendations, already making £4.5 million of funding available, which includes support which will tackle gender segregation, training and employment programmes. And in the autumn, I will set out more detailed plans on how we will work with schools, colleges, training providers and employers to ensure that existing stereotypes are challenged and barriers are removed. Improving participation is one half of the challenge we face in maximising Scotland's productivity. As important is creating an environment in which all of those in work, including women, can thrive and prosper more equitably than they have been able to do before. And last week, I welcomed the recommendations of the Working Together Review of Progressive Workplace Policies. And the review suggests how we can, through a partnership approach, address labour market challenges and build on existing good practice in our industrial relations. We will work with businesses and trade unions in framing our joint response to that commission. And taken together with developing Scotland's young workforce, eh, this will provide Scotland with the opportunity eh, to bring the right skills into the right jobs, transform people's lives and our workplaces through more equal access to work and fairer treatment and work. Presiding officer, today I want to update Parliament on progress in two important areas. The Working Together Review recognised the value of a Fair Work Commission as envisaged in Scotland's future as a means to support sustainable employment that pays fairly. And the Equal Pay Act was introduced in 1970, 44 years later. It is clear that the current constitutional arrangements are not delivering for women in Scotland. And I want to see early action. So with independence, the Fair Work Commission will, as its first priority, begin work collaboratively with unions, businesses and others to progress a review of the costs and benefits of mandatory equal pay audits. 
and we want women to be better represented at the highest levels of public authorities. On the 30th of April 2014, uh, we launched the, the Women on Board consultation to determine how a minimum quota of 40% female representation could be introduced. And the consultation closed on the 4th of July and we received a range of views on how to address the gender imbalance on our boards, which has helped focus our thinking on how best to address the barriers women faced. And our commitment in this area makes it clear that this is not an issue on which we are prepared to wait any longer. And yesterday, Shona Robison wrote to the UK Government to request the transfer of the legal competence in the equality field to the Scottish Parliament. We have made clear that we believe these powers should rest in Scotland as quickly as possible and in advance of full independence. And we will establish a short life working group to develop a plan for the implementation of quotas harness and political support together with expertise around the appointments process to deliver truly gender diverse boards with the highest calibre of men and women. Presiding officer, on the 18th of September, we have the opportunity to create an independent Scotland, a Scotland unconstrained in its ambition, a Scotland which will maximise opportunities for everyone in the economy, including women, and a Scotland which fully unlocks our potential. And the plans I have outlined today demonstrate that following a vote for independence, we will use those powers to deliver a fairer and more equal society. And I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. <laughs> and I now call on Jenny Mara to speak to and move Amendment 10829.3. Ms Mara, nine minutes or thereby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this debate this afternoon and would like to start by moving the amendment in my name. I'm absolutely clear, and we are on these benches, that increasing opportunities for women is best achieved in this Scottish Parliament within the United Kingdom. And I want to take this opportunity today. Um, the, the Cabinet Secretary talked about the Equal Pay Act in her closing remarks to talk a bit about um, the Labour Minister, Barbara Castle, and her role in fighting for the rights of women across the UK, because she was the crusader for women's rights and opportunities in the 1960s, who broke the glass ceiling, not just for women in politics, but also in society more widely. She fought for the cause of equal rights between men and women. And it was a crusade led by women, including many unrecognised working class women across the UK that resulted in the Equal Pay Act, which was introduced by Castle. It began life not in the House of Commons, not in a parliament building, but in an industrial dispute in Dagenham in Essex. Most of us know the story about the female car seat ma machinists at the Ford plant in Dagenham who took their industrial action to Downing Street to get their work recognised as skilled and equal to their male counterparts. Now, this created the impetus that led to the equal pay uh, legal uh, obligation that the Cabinet Secretary talked about to pay both men and women the same. But these women in Essex were not solely concerned about their own rights in that Ford factory. They were motivated by securing rights for women across Britain, just as the suffragettes had been years before them, across Britain, across Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. They led that progressive movement for equal pay. And these progressive movements in the trade union movement have always joined hands and forces with their brothers and sisters um, in, in towns and cities of Scotland, across England, Wales and Northern Ireland, because their aim has always been to tear down barriers and not to erect borders. The United Kingdom is an economic union with a deeply integrated economy in which goods and services are traded. And being part of the large and diverse UK economy provides strength and stability to Scotland's finances, as we know from all the economic analysis over the last year. It also offers protection to Scotland from unexpected economic and financial shocks that we've seen in our own lifetimes for both men and women. The rest of the United Kingdom is Scotland's biggest trading partner. And at the core of the argument for economic union is the opportunity and security it provides to women, families and businesses across this country. I do not believe it is in Scotland's interest for the economic union to be torn apart. 
In the long term, an independent Scotland could not remain part of an integrated UK economy. The economic union means we share a currency and can pool our taxes and spending in fiscal union, which ultimately benefits women. Now, this fiscal integration in turn necessitates and sustains a sense of social solidarity and provides security to Scotland's women through the sharing of risks, rewards and resources on the basis of need rather than the basis of nationality, which the SNP posit. It is convenient, but it is not honest for the SNP to ignore that it was a UK Labour government working with a Labour-led administration in this Parliament that made substantial inroads into expanding opportunities for women by making work pay through the minimum wage, which the SNP were not present to vote for, by instigating tax credits. Certainly. Angela Constance. Given that Ms Mara is a great believer in the power of Westminster to change her lives uh, for, the, for the good, I wonder if she can tell me that why the Equal Pay Act, despite it being as old as I am, that's how old it is, has still to be fully implemented if Westminster is such a success. Well, the Equal Pay Act was a very ambitious piece of legislation that has made great inroads in equalising pay between men and women. Yes, it has got a way to go, but the Cabinet Secretary fails to explain exactly how she would immediately create equal pay Absolutely. in Scotland. If she can, I'm happy to take another intervention if she would like to tell me her yearly target for that and how quickly that's going to be achieved and how she's going to do it. And if you had been listening to my speech, you would see that the first priority for a Fair Work Commission is to implement uh, mandatory equal pay audits so we can identify and address the problem as speedy as possible. And not wait, not wait till I'm in my dotage or in my 80s. Actually, and I was listening very carefully to the Cabinet Secretary because she failed to do exactly that in the Procurement Reform Bill. So I don't know why she's making, she voted down amendments on exactly that. So why it's a commitment for the future, but why she didn't do it four weeks ago when she had the chance and the power to do it really confuses me. Presiding officer, I'd like to continue, if I may, that it was Labour that rescued the apprenticeship system, creating more than a quarter of a million places a year. And and we will now expand technician level apprenticeships to ensure that Britain has the skills it needs for the future. Labour believes in order to improve opportunities for women, it is essential to have a world class further education sector to provide the training and skills that are essential to meet the long term needs of the economy and that the loss of 140,000 college places since the Cabinet Secretary's government took power in 2007 completely undermines the achievement of this objective. Since 0708, the SNP have slashed 84,099 college places for young women, whilst there are 56,000 fewer men in college. Opportunities for women have been lost as college places for women returning to work have completely disappeared under the SNP. Now, the Wood Commission... Constance? I'd just like to challenge Ms Mara on, on that last point. While very short-term courses, uh, the Scottish Funding Council has decided uh, not to fund, but all courses uh, that have employability or progression into work uh, still remain in our college system. And can I remind her uh, that the majority of college students are indeed women, particularly those full-time students uh, studying recognised qualifications? Jenny Mara. I have no idea how the Cabinet Secretary can uh, contend that short-term courses have no economic impact and help people get back to work. She doesn't want to face up to the reality that 80,000 less women have attended college since her government took power. Now, the Wood Commission recommends that we need to establish a parity of esteem between further and higher education sectors to secure those skills base that Scotland needs. Now, the Scottish Government has accepted and endorsed the Wood Commission recommendations. How then does that square with the SNP cutting further education budgets and its disproportionate impact on women? Angela Constance has committed to reducing youth unemployment. I'm happy to seek an intervention from the Minister if she wants. Angela Constance has committed to reducing youth unemployment by 40% on the back of the Wood Commission recommendations. What commitment can the Cabinet Secretary give to making sure that women will make up at least 
half of this target. Maybe she'll address that in her closing remarks. But I'm also still confused, as I raised with her last week, by her commitment to reducing youth unemployment by 40% when John Swinney has announced that there will be full employment in an independent Scotland and seems to have found jobs for 100% ah. of young people. No, I don't have much time left, sorry. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell me why her target of 40% is far less ambitious than John Swinney's promise of 100%? These figures are not even close. Have they discussed their employment strategy or their targets? Have they even chatted about it? President Officer, I welcome the recent Working Together review and its agenda for progressive workplace policies and the role in the STUC in taking that agenda forward. I what I want to know is how much of this agenda will be taken forward in the event of a no vote, because many of the recommendations in that uh, document that was released last week can actually be implemented now. And I would urge the Scottish Government to maybe give us details of that in the autumn. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you so much. And I now call on Mary Scanlon to speak to and move Amendment 108.29.2. Uh, thank you. Six minutes, please, thank you, Mr. Officer. Uh, I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for the opportunity to debate increasing opportunities for women. Uh, this has been a constant theme in this parliamentary debate since 1999. But as the briefings from Engender State in the sectors of construction and agriculture, forestry and fishing, the percentage of women is only 17%, compared to 73% of women in public administration, education and health. And although the Construction Industry Training Board has outlined some of the work currently in hand to, to address these issues, I think we can all agree that there's still much more to do. Uh, and also on the consensual note, we also welcome the recommendations 28, 9 and 30 in the final Wood Commission report, which encourages more gender balance across occupations and uh, a welcome action plan to address gender disparities within college education and modern apprenticeships. Uh, these are sound policies, but of course it's the implementation that counts. In gender state that Scotland's employability strategy recognises that gender is a key factor in shaping barriers to employment, but they go on to say, and I quote, to date, such an amalgamated policy tool has not been delivered. And in the same briefing paper for this debate, in gender states at the Women's Employment Summit, held in 2012, reflected the increased political will to engage with women and work, uh, but substantial shifts uh, in policy resulting from the summit remain to be identified. Um, so on childcare, uh, again, I can do no better than quote from our own parliament's uh, research and information centre, which confirms that the Scottish Government figure of increased childcare bringing 104,000 women back into work is, presiding officer, to be polite, inaccurate. With an analysis which includes that instead of 104,000 women coming back into work, there are 64,000 women who are economically inactive in this group, of which 14,000 would like to work. So the SPICE briefing confirms that the Scottish figure, Government figures have been exaggerated only by 90,000. And childcare, of course, is a devolved issue, uh, not just now, with an increase in childcare entitlement already happening and nothing to stop further increases being implemented by this Parliament. Uh, Secretary, just I wonder if uh, Mrs Scanlon would accept that there are around 50,000 babies born every year in Scotland and therefore every year women are lost from the labour market uh, because you don't need to be an economist to know that one of the biggest barriers uh, to women getting into work is access to childcare. Therefore, will she accept that the 
transformational uh, impact of childcare policy over a period of time is the point that is worth recognising. Uh, the point that is General. worth recognising, and I am familiar with uh, how many children are born, the point that is worth recognising is the fact that your figures were not modelled and the spice briefing figures are modelled. They have done a proper economic analysis and I rest my case with the figures I have given. The figures released earlier this month on female participation in the Scottish and United Kingdom markets are very encouraging, with the unemployment rate down to 6.4% 6 for both, unemployment rates up for both, as well as economically inactive women reduced also. So all economic indicators moving in the right direction, but as I said earlier, still more to do. Uh, but to me, it's not just about getting women into work. Uh, it's about giving women the full career training and educational opportunities to make sure that the time at work pays and career opportunities are open. And I agree with the point the Cabinet Secretary made. It's about ensuring work is well rewarded. The Scottish Government's record on women is well documented uh, in the College's Scotland briefing paper for today's debate. And I quote from their paper, since the SNP came to power in 2007, there has been a small increase, which is welcome, of 4,500 women on full-time courses in further education. This is against a background of a fall of 100,544 women in part-time, so 4,000 more full-time, but over 100,000 fewer in part-time. In total, 96,000 fewer women in further education now than when the Nationalists came to power. And I say, presiding officer, this is the type of course that I did as a single mum many years ago that gave me the qualifications to go on to the University of Dundee, spend 20 years lecturing economics and further in higher education, and here I am. So I ask this Parliament and the Government Ministers, do not dismiss part-time courses. They are a way out of poverty and into a career for many women across Scotland, which is now denied as a result of nationalist, nationalist policies. Members the UK in children, minute. and got 14 seconds left, uh, for UK Children Families Act replace, uh, allows more flexible working uh, and the IMF has stated the United Kingdom is going to be the fastest growing economy in the G7. Taxpayers, including women in Scotland, benefit from the raise in the personal allowance and I would also say that public spending in Scotland is £1,600 per head higher than in England. So it's no wonder that the SNP are having problems persuading women to vote yes. Women know the differences between promises and action. So we will be supporting the Labour and Lib Dem amendments today, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you so much. And I now call on Alison McInnes to speak to and move Amendment 10829.1. Thank Mr. you. Um, six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I move the amendment in my name. In seeking to appeal to women voters, the Nationalists continue to tout uncosted plans and peddle myths on the currency, on childcare, and most recently on the NHS. Anything to distract from their record of failing women across Scotland. The Scottish Government claims it wants the powers to ensure 40% of public board members are women. But this doesn't stand up favourably to scrutiny. It had the chance to show they meant business from the outset. But the representation of women amongst its nominations to the very next body appointed after that announcement, the Fiscal Commission, only amounted to 33% of women. Two years ago, I supported Jenny Mara's amendments to the Police and Fire Reform Bill, that would have required representation on national police and fire authorities to be at least 40% women, 40% men. The proposal was dismissed by her, her colleague, the Justice Secretary, and voted down by SNP colleagues on the Justice Committee. Kenny McCaskill argued that it was not necessary to be prescriptive about that in the bill, and that it was micromanaging. I also re re recollect the Scottish Government defeating calls to establish a 40% gender quota throughout Scotland's public bodies on a debate here in this chamber on the 14th of June 2012 that, again, Jenny Mara um, drove forward. Board membership... 
if uh, Ms McGuinness will uh, lend her support to the letter that uh, Shona Robinson sent to the UK Government yesterday, um, calling for a Section 30 order and giving competence to this, this Parliament uh, on the equalities field. I will, will she support Mr McGuinness? I will consider that. I, um, board membership should be broadly representative of our society, and I'm frustrated by the lack of progress towards increasing women's representation in public life in Scotland. And as I've said before to this chamber, the pace of change here is glacial. While the SNP's apparent conversion to this cause is welcome, their bona fides must be questioned given their record of inaction. Elsewhere, as Mary Scanlon uh, referenced, Scottish Government cuts to college places have greatly restricted opportunities to learn. Colleges Scotland tell us the number of women studying part-time has halved, plunging from 200,000 in 2007 to less than 100,000 today. Thousands of women who find it impossible to study full-time have missed out, and that's parents, carers, those with work or financial commitments. What thought was given to the ambitions of women when those budget cuts were being voted through by SNP backbenchers? Strong and sustainable growth relies on our getting the best out of everyone, women and men. And that's why it's so disappointing that a wealth of female ta talent is not retained or properly recognised. It's diverted elsewhere or overlooked. Nearly three quarters of women with STEM qualifications do not work in the STEM industries. But there is little evidence that the Scottish Government is providing leadership on driving this forward. The RSE report is now two years old. Regrettably, the provision of free childcare has become another pawn in this government's attempt to break up the UK. Liberal Democrats campaigned for 18 months for the extension of free childcare provision. We know it's one of the best ways to address the disadvantages our most vulnerable children face and enable more parents to remain in or return to work. Again and again, ministers told us they couldn't help more than 1% of two-year-olds without additional powers. But thanks to the persistence of my colleagues Willie Rennie and Liam MacArthur, 8,400 extra two-year-olds from poorer backgrounds are today toddling through the doors of nurseries. That's 15%, not 1%. Next year, it will be 27%. So, no. Action from Liberal Democrats and the UK Government to boost the tax-free allowance means that 160,000 families in Scotland will receive additional help with childcare costs from next year. But it's essential our children don't fall behind those south of the border. There, 40% of two-year-olds will benefit from free childcare, thanks to the Liberal Democrats. However, the Scottish Government has opted to hold back. I'd like to make some progress. Rather than use the powers it already has to help more families, it's withholding further childcare as a bargaining chip for voters. The Scottish Government has absolutely failed to use all the powers at its disposal to break down social and economic barriers. But of course, women are, opportunities for women are as intrinsically linked to the success of our economy as they are to confronting cultural or social challenges. And as my amendment notes, the lack of certainty around the Scottish Government's currency plan B puts women's jobs and future aspirations on the line. The currency choice de determines our mortgage rates, levels of trade with other countries, how much we can tax and spend, in some, the stability of the entire financial system. And yesterday, the First Minister's Chief Currency Advisor said sterilisation might only last six months. Every option the Nationalists put on the table is second best to what we have now. Second best to the stability we are afforded by being part of the UK. Members second the best minute. to being backed by one of the oldest and most successful currencies in the world. Analysis has shown 270,000 jobs in Scotland, some 10%, are linked to the UK's single integrated market. That's the jobs of more than 100,000 women in sectors from mining to fin finance are intrinsically connected to trade with the rest of the UK. For goodness sake, why erect an international border between Scotland and our largest trading partner, with whom our economy is so heavily integrated? These are the issues which will have the greatest influence in determining the opportunities of women in Scotland. As part of the United Kingdom, we can have the best of both worlds. Significant decision-making powers here in this Parliament together with the strength, stability and security that being part of the UK brings. And that is actually the compelling positive case for saying no. Thank you very much. And we now move to the open debate. And I call on Christine Graham to be followed by Jane Baxter. Speeches of six minutes or thereby, please.
Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise to support the motion, reject the amendments which put short, say the union is everything good and independence is everything bad. As for Alison McInnes's uh, amendment, which I like, uh, like Alison, not the amendment, is a bit like war and peace. I never got to the end of that and I never got to the end of her amendment. I've never seen such a long one in my life. First of all, Pew, I must start by declaring that I have had careers as a secondary teacher, solicitor and politician and this flows from having a privileged background. I was privileged to have enlightened parents who made it clear from the start that though I came from a working class family with five children living in a council house scheme, I had the same rights to opportunities as the children in the bungalows around the corner who went to Edinburgh's fee paying schools. I was privileged not to pay tuition fees and because of the family circumstances had a grant. I was privileged to have a grant to live away from home although attending the local university because there was nowhere to study in a house with so many children. So thanks to the SNP, I now see also tuition fees have gone, as so they should. And parental encouragement, as always, remains vital. So I want to welcome progress over the decades of erasing the image of women's places, to put it crudely, in the home by the kitchen sink. Though erasing is not complete and is far too slow in its progress, I too admire Barbara Castle. But glacial, you have to look to the progress to Westminster bringing in equalities to no glacial when you see it. Now, I don't have as much time as Jenny Mara. So it's not fully erased, of course, as the image of the young woman, or indeed any woman, shape, size, dress, sense, and so on, plays too large a part as compared to the male species. Even politicians do not escape. Who cares about kitten heels? I dress for me and me alone. Neither have the educational choices changed much. When I was at school, a girl studying maths, physics and chemistry, which I did, was a rarity. Biology and botany was much more frequent and indeed acceptable, and it seems to me to be much the same today. As for engineering, it was a female-free zone. Decades on, change is not substantial. For example, I note from the agenda briefing that by far and away the greater percentage of women on the workforce, as has been said in public administration, education and health. Now, this may reflect the talents of women in these areas, but there's more at work here and not all responsibility can be placed on governments either here or at Westminster or indeed the education system. So from the very start, education towards opportunities for women takes a certain path. Then there's the issue of the constraints put on careers opportunities beyond the educational path. And many of these constraints, though not exclusively, and lovely though they are, are children. Now, while a potential employer cannot overtly ask a female applicant the question of children in the future, I have no doubt for some employers, it's a consideration at the back of their mind and will influence whether or not to offer that job. For those with children, change days when from women, myself included, we were expected to and did stop work till the children reached school age. Much better now when there are statutory obligations on employers and, of course, the significant importance of free childcare hours could be better, but much improved under this government and much to be improved if we had full control over our revenue and tax system and gave women, in particular, though not exclusively, freedom to have a life with time for work and for family. Because at the end of the day, if you have happy and contented children growing into responsible adults, whether you have opted for work, full or part-time, or for full-time parenting, that's an achievement for me. That's a measure which really counts and which society will benefit in countless ways. Inexcusable, of course, is the pay gap and, of course, the continuing glass ceiling upon which many of us, me included, have bumped our heads. Twice I changed career direction because women already employed told me of the limitations imposed on them. So while not myself in favour of statutory gender balance, because I reject anything approaching tokenism, I refer here to the dearth of women in high places. I really understand why many in this chamber are exasperated and feel there must be a remedy. But what I haven't got time, sorry, Jane. What of the older women and the women who are full-time carers? 62% are unpaid. They step in, often unseen and unsung, and often do not recognise that they are indeed carers, doing it for love, not for the lolly. This does not exempt society from supporting them financially and physically with, say, respite breaks. 
My hope is that with the rebirth of the Scottish nation, there will be that opportunity, whatever the results of the first Scottish general election in 2016, for Scotland to spread its compassionate wings further than it can under current constraints. For if we dispossess our young women of opportunities, we may dispossess their daughters. And if we take for granted the older women who provide support for generations on either side of them, the support to care for grandchildren, their infirm partner, their ageing parents, we as a society fail to recognise there are many more ways to contribute to society than to bring home a pay packet. That is also a measure of productivity. Thank you very much. Now call on Jane Baxter to be followed by Chick Brodie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity today to discuss increasing women's economic opportunities and I support aspirations to improve the chances of women who may find themselves far away from the labour market or from access to education and training. But it will come as no surprise when I say that I disagree with the conclusion drawn in the Scottish Government's motion, as I believe that many of the aims set out therein can be achieved under the powers we currently have through devolution. We already have powers over education, training, employability and economic development. The levers already available to the Scottish Government to tackle unemployment, underemployment or lack of training or educational opportunities are there just now. And we should ensure that we're using them all because the barriers facing women entering the labour market are varied and complex. And this is a fact which has been recognised by the Scottish Government and I may not agree with the need for independence to improve the life chances for women, but I do agree that it's absolutely vital that we must ensure that every woman has a chance to enter the labour market or education, should she so wish. For many women, it's about childcare. For others, it's about being able to find a place on a college course in their local area, which will provide them with the skills that employers are looking for. And the challenges they face in achieving this may vary, depending on whether they live in an urban area or the countryside. Fife Gingerbread and the Poverty Alliance have carried out work looking at the challenges facing single mothers in rural areas and have previously highlighted the excellent report into poverty and lone parenthood. In that report, the women who were interviewed consistently referred back to the challenges of finding suitable childcare and the barriers that this prevented to them accessing not just employment but college courses as well. And given the attention which has been given to childcare in recent months, this is not surprising news. Indeed, many of the issues which are so relevant to increasing opportunities for women were explored in the passage of the Children and Young People's Bill. However, what is clear to me from the feedback that I have had from parents and childcare providers across Mid Scotland and Fife is that the number of hours of childcare is not the be-all and end-all of the childcare debate. If those hours are not available at a time which suits them, then families will not be able to access the support which is required to enable them to participate in education, training or employment. For many families, they are forced to either juggle their local authority provision with support from a childminder or family members, or use a private nursery which may be more able to meet their hours. Interestingly, the Growing Up in Scotland report into the characteristics, characteristics of preschool provision and their association with child development outcomes picks up on this point. Their report noted that the use of private childcare providers increased with income and just 7% of children from households in the lowest income group attended a private provider, compared with 24% of children from households in the highest income group. On this point, the report concluded, and I quote, that these differences reflect the different needs of couple families with both parents employed. But for those who do not have an extended family network or are not in a two-parent family, then it's vital that we see an increase in provision of more flexible wraparound childcare, whether that's breakfast clubs, after school clubs, provision during school holidays or extended opening hours. But it's the same old argument that we've, had, we've seen time and time again from the Scottish Government. Post-independence, all will be well. Ignoring the fact that many of the issues they focus on can already be addressed by this Government under powers it already has. The importance of college provision in increasing opportunities for women, especially those from our most deprived communities, is inarguable. And that's why it's so hugely concerning that the Scottish Government's cuts to college courses have disproportionately affected women. Warm words from ministers today are all very well, but in our communities, the negative consequences of this Government's choices are all too clear. 
Occupational segregation in vocational training and apprenticeships has been raised by the Wood Commission and in a recent report by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. The EHRC found evidence of men increasingly moving into traditionally female apprenticeship programmes, but no evidence of an overall increase of women entering traditionally male apprenticeships. To have 3% of women in engineering apprenticeships is such a shockingly small figure that it shows the problems are systemic throughout society. Girls' attitudes to STEM subjects and the condoning by society of gender stereotype rules for young women is a huge problem which needs challenged. The EHRC also found that there is significant gender spend on apprenticeships in Scotland, with spend per male apprentice being 53% higher than for female apprenticeships. This is deeply concerning. The Scottish Government has the power to act on this immediately and I urge it to do so. We may argue about how best to improve women's participation in non-traditional areas of education and employment, and I welcome innovative ideas which will target this problem. However, it's clear to me, and I hope to many others, that constitutional change will not tackle the structural inequality of our society, because it's this structural inequality which can hugely influence the economic op op opportunities open to women. So it's disappointing that the Scottish Government sees fit to bring forward this debate under its usual mantle of independence will solve everything. I fully support proposals to increase opportunities for women, but I want to see it right across Scotland and the rest of the UK, and not by imposing artificial barriers between people across the United Kingdom. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on Chick Rory to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a very important debate, particularly in one that calls for a higher ambition, not just for a very a significant element of Scotland's workforce, but also on behalf of the significant foundation of Scotland's future economy and its growth, which is women. I support the motion uh, as laid before us, but this is not just about women. Uh, I make no apology for drawing the Parliament's attention to the significant progress already made, but also to the need for a change in culture still to be promoted to exploit the opportunities for women, both by women themselves, but much more importantly, a culture change uh, by men. A need, if I may say, epitomised by a parliamentarian making a statement that, and I quote, women need to think what they want to do while they are doing the ironing. That charge was laid, of course, by the ex-Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gifford, against that crusader, crusader for freedom and justice, the current Prime Minister of Australia, the Oxford-educated Tony Abbott related to the UK Prime Minister, of course, to the joint business relationship of the, their respected, respective advisors. Presiding officer, in the business of securing freedom and justice, promoting fairness and gender equality, that misogyny has no place in Scotland and nor shall we ever seek advice from that source. Presiding officer, there are so many areas of increased uh, and increasing contribution by women and the need for extending that contribution further, I believe, can only be done when we have full powers over welfare, a reform of our employment laws, and of course, ensuring that we secure human rights in the uh, new written constitution of an independent Scotland. Now, I make no apologies for concentrating in today's debate on opportunities for women in business and entrepreneurship. We arrive at positions sometimes uh, based on personal experiences. And in my personal long experience in business, I found women were and are the best managers and business facilitators, as be it in customer service, HR, credit control, or indeed in the cases I was involved in setting up uh, a subsidiary in Europe by a woman colleague. Uh, given the flexibility in each of these situations and other as required, these women managers invariably exceeded the performance of their male uh, counterparts. Yesterday morning, presiding officer on Radio Scotland, I listened to a programme about opportunities for women. It clarified that women have to work 14 years more longer than men to achieve the same aggregate income, or that women in their 40s invariably earn, on average, in some cases, 40 per cent uh, less than men, even with an earlier uh, retirement age. That does not, in my opinion, mitigate these circumstances. And when a comparison was made in the same programme about uh, men's ambition for progress and that of women, men invariably, and in, partly and perhaps 
unsurprisingly chased a higher salary and benefits as a number one priority, whereas women chose location, then work sociability, and then flexibility. And if we are to fully secure the opportunities for women, which I'm sure we all desire, and consider the fairness and equality needed, then a seismic culture change is required, not least to men's role and a man's role in the family. I experienced that with my, my stepson, who uh, has raised in the family home uh, our twin uh, granddaughters, while his, his uh, wife carries out uh, a very uh, important international function and happily, they live in Singapore. So flexibility, fairness, and equality of opportunity are paramount. Now, in the re research from the Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship, it's showing that increasing the number of women entrepreneurs to match the number of men would actually generate 7.6 billion extra for the Scottish economy. That is not a small cost, a small price. I would, however, caution that uh, setting numbers like 40% on boards or matching the number of men when alpha males are out there seeing that to be the norm. This morning at the EET committee, uh, reflecting on the great success of the Edinburgh Festival and festivals, our witness panel comprised 80% of women, the chief executives of the Forum, the Festival, the Fringe and Creative New Zealand, and they deservedly uh, they deserve to, to, to be there because the festival, as we know, is a jewel in the Scottish branding crown. Presiding officer, the government's role is critical in establishing a level playing field for women in entrepreneurship and the establishment of the Women in Enterprise Network, the financial support for the Women's Enterprise uh, Business Ambassadors and the Investing Women Initiative are stepping stones to that level uh, playing field as will be the outcomes, I'm sure, from the working together of you and the Young Workforce Commission. But the culture among men must also change so that the creation and promotion of opportunities for women, and indeed, and indeed for men, uh, are seen as a wider sense of acceptance of value as part of the overall remuneration. Now, these are based on merit and contribution, and that a more flexible working environment and environments are something we must eventually work toward. Thank you very much. Now call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Six minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Gender inequality is built in in Scotland and throughout most of the world. There are notable exceptions, however, these countries who have worked hard to create an equal society. In Scotland, the areas where power is wielded are male-dominated. Without action, this will continue because like appoints like. People exercise the power they wield in a way that reflects their own experience, not deliberately, but it's natural. We all make decisions based on our own knowledge and experience. To redress the power imbalance, we need to be brave and we need to take positive action. We need to look at equal pay, not just for the same job, but for jobs requiring similar levels of skills and experience. I often quote the salary of a police officer, which is a male-dominated career, and a nurse, which is a female-dominated career. Both careers require a public service ethos, the ability to care and assist others, and both have built-in inherent dangers that can be life-threatening. One requires three to four years of university study and job-based training. The other requires 12 weeks college-based training, followed by 20 weeks as a probationer. After training, the staff nurse who studies for three or four years earns just over £21,500. The probationer police officer who has not finished their training earns over £26,000 at 31 weeks. This is gender-based pay. It happens more widely. Jobs that pay the minimum wage are often female-dominated occupations. We need to deal with gendered pay segregation and place equal value on the work carried out, regardless of the gender domination of that, that person or profession. The life of a child's life chances depends on his mother's education and pay. It's only by lifting women out of poverty that you tackle child poverty. It does come at a cost, but so does the alternative. What is the cost of a child 
growing up in poverty, not only the cost to that child alone, but to wider society when that child becomes dependent on services because its life chances have been curtailed, because its health has been damaged, and its own children who are again born into poverty. If we're serious about tackling child poverty, we must first tackle the mother's poverty. Sexual exploitation is also a result of gendered poverty and inequality. We can tackle sexual ex exploitation by giving women access to economic levers and equal pay. We can eradicate the desperation of poverty that pushes people into those types of exploitation. By creating a more equal society, you make it unacceptable for people to be bought and sold because of their gender. To do this, you must have women in positions of power. And that won't happen because like appoints like. Because of this, we have a, a built-in imbalance and then built-in discrimination occurs. We see this by the lack of women in positions of power and we need positive discrimination to correct this balance in order that we can go forward with equality. Taking these steps is difficult because of vested interests. Most people would say they believe in equality, but the reality is not so palatable if you're being the one asked to step aside to allow it to happen. The Scottish Labour Party put forward proposals to have positive discrimination on public boards, but this was rejected by the Scottish Government at the time, as Jenny Mara told us earlier. However, it's now been promised if Scotland votes for separation. Surely this is an election bribe. People would have more confidence in these proposals had the Scottish Government not used their majority to vote down the proposals in the past. This debate today could have been about implementing this now. They could have said, regardless of the result on the 18th of September, they will implement these policies for the boards that they appoint themselves, taking leadership instead of passing the buck and engaging in constitutional wrangles. They won't. Actions speak louder than words. And do they really believe that women are so gullible? They have done the same with regard to childcare, but did not even bother to do the research or cost their policy properly. However, if we're going to create opportunities for women, we do need to make it easier for women to work. We need to provide affordable, accessible childcare now. A pipe dream promise is not good enough. We should also have to share caring duties between the sexes. Men should also have to share the responsibility for childcare. Both partners and employers contributing to their employees' time off for childcare responsibilities. Women who take career breaks to bring up children often struggle to catch up with men in the workplace who have not had to do this. Were this shared, it would, pro it would provide equality in the workplace and create a more equal society. We need to encourage, and of course we do, women into male-dominated uh, workforces, which are therefore more highly paid. Profe but we also need to value the professions and the careers pursued by women. These career choices are often hugely important in our society, caring roles, looking after the young, old and unwell. We all depend on those roles. We have all been young, we all hope to be old and we will all experience an ill health at some point. However, we don't value those roles at all. It is sad that we're still debating opportunities for women so many decades since the impact of inequality has been recognised. We will do this by changing our society, not by changing our country. We need to tackle these difficult decisions now and step up to tackling the inequalities in our society. And that's what we should be doing now rather than wrangling about our constitution. Thank you very much. Now I call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Dr Elaine Murray. A generous six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The women of Scotland across the centuries have been drivers for change, in spite of the social and economic barriers that have constantly worked against them. We have testament to some seriously impressive her heroines who have blazed a trail, and we are rightly proud of it. Let's take a brief look back at her, to our historical sisters, maybe a wee bit further back than Christine Graham was able to go in her contribution. But St Margaret of Scotland, born in exile in Hungary via Northumbria, Margaret arrived in 1068 at what we now know as St Margaret's Hope near North Queensferry. She married Malcolm III. Driven by her faith, she served the orphans and the poor every day before she ate and established the Benedictine Order Monastery at Dunfermline, as well as the ferries between Queensferry and North Berwick. And she was the power behind the restoration of the monastery at Iona. So opportunities for women to make an impact in Scotland, even in the 11th century, well, were limited. 
My namesake, Christina, the sister of Robert the Bruce, moved things along a bit a few centuries later. She commanded the garrison at Kildrummy Castle and successfully held out against pro baloyal forces led by David of Strathbogie prior to her defeat by, uh, their defeat by her husband, Saint and Sir Andrew Murray, at the Battle of Colveen. But there is no lack of feistiness among our Scottish ancestors. Mary Slessor came out of the slums of Dundee and became a skilled jute worker before she decided to follow in the missionary footsteps of David Livingston. She transformed the role of women in Nigeria, especially in her work with twins, regarded as an evil curse, and rescued hundreds. She adopted every pair she found abandoned, taking one surviving twin girl as her own daughter. Elsie Inglis was an innovative Scottish doctor and suffragist who wasn't to be held back by tradition. Her dissatisfaction with the standard of medical care available to women led to her becoming politically active and playing an important role in the early years of the Scottish Federation of Women's Suffrage Societies. There are dozens more Scottish women worthy of mention, but I want to show especially how far forward we have moved and how much further we can travel in an independent Scotland. Independence is about opportunity, prosperity and a mission for sustainable economy. That word mission has broadened its meaning since Mary Slessor's time, but I'm certain she would understand that we are now striving in terms of a mission for equality. Professor Ailsa Mackay, who died a few months ago at the age of only 50, taught me a lot about making a difference and about how just how tenacious you need to be to be a success in that. Ailsa's voice was crucial to the current SNP government's decision to commit hugely to extended childcare in Scotland, so encouraging more women to rejoin or join the workforce. She not only changed the culture at Glasgow University, she helped draw Scottish, Scottish government policy on equality, and she worked very, very hard at that. Westminster seems to have a different view entirely. Labour MP Austin Mitchell thinks that women prefer to discuss family and social issues rather than the big issues like should we invade Iraq. He doesn't think there should be more women in Parliament because they'd be preoccupied with family and social issues. Women MPs, as he says, and I quote, more leadable and the feminisation of Parliament will make MPs more preoccupied with the local rather than the international. The small problems rather than the big issues and ideas. If he seriously imagines that the big ticket issues of the economy, austerity, jobs, investment, international affairs and the future prosperity are of less concern to women than men, then I would suggest it's a good idea for him to attend a few yes meetings I've been at. Mr Mitchell is another glaring example of how Westminster is failing Scotland. More of that is what a no vote guarantees, and any of the women in this chamber who doesn't see that are seriously kidding themselves on. So let's look at the last and current generations of political Scottish women, women like Winnie Ewan, Margot MacDonald, Nicola Sturgeon, our very own Angela Constance or Rosanna Cunningham, and the rest of us MSPs, yes I include us all, determined and committed to improving the lives of our constituents and of broader Scotland. Presiding officer, Yesterday, I held in my arms a baby girl. She was born in my constituency. Her name's Blair Archibald. She was born on American Independence Day, the 4th of July. She will truly be an Independence Day girl. And I want to especially commend her to our future of Scotland, the one that recognises women and sees that rather than being also rans, we are in there fighting the same causes as men, and we are not that different. It is the same issues of fairness, and equality that drives us all. The same beliefs in our right to make our own decisions for ourselves. I am confident that Blair, who will be just a few months old when her parents vote on referendum day, will be one of those icons for our new generation of independent Scottish women. We must put women where our ambassadors have claimed that space. And I gave you a history of that, a thousand years worth of Scottish history. But let's do it with a yes vote. It won't happen otherwise. The Scottish Government is committed, and I do hope the Westminster Government answers the Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson's call yesterday to devolve equality. But let's not devolve it. Let's just make equality independent. So this Government is committed to increasing the opportunities for women to enter the workforce. With the powers we have, we have delivered real improvements in equality outcomes. But more can and must be done. A yes vote is the greatest opportunity we will ever have.
to transform women's lives for the better through transformational expansion in childcare, improving diversity in public and private institutions, and targeting female represent representation on company and public boards. For Blair and for all of our daughters of Scotland, put Scotland's future and Blair's future in Scotland's hands. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a little bit of time in hand for interventions. I call Elaine Murray to be followed by Willie Crawford. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, it is, of course, to be welcomed that the numbers of women uh, in employment have increased and that the levels of female act inactivity have fallen. But I think it would be wrong uh, to be complacent about the figures because I think there are certain, certain questions that need to be asked about the detail. How many of these women are on zero hour contract? How many are underemployed, how many are on the minimum wage, how many are self-employed but unable to make a living uh, from what they earn. A discussion as recently as yesterday morning on BBC Radio Scotland's morning call centred around the statistic that the average woman in Scotland would have to work 14 years longer than the average man to earn the same amount across her working lifetime. It's also wrong and indeed I think naive to imply that the barriers faced by women in terms of equality of opportunity are somehow the fault of Westminster and that they can only be solved by voting for Scotland to leave the United Kingdom. Barriers such as gender segregation, where women are stereotypically found in low-paid female occupations, as my colleague Rhoda Grant illustrated, and their underrepresentation in boardrooms or at senior management positions are not just a matter of constitutional responsibility. Nor are the additional responsibilities which women tend to face, which can interfere with their employment prospects, such as the likelihood that they will have primary caring responsibilities, not just for children out with the time they are in nursery or school, but also when they are ill, they are more likely to, women are more likely to have to care for sick or elderly relatives. The existence of these barriers is not just that the UK government has failed to legislate. Jenny Mara described the uh, genesis of the Equal Pay Act passed in 1970. Uh, the Equalities Act, which superseded it, was passed in 2010. And the current UK government, who I don't often have anything good to say about, included the sharing of parental leave and the right to request fe flexible working in its Children and Families Act earlier this year. It may be that the legislation is not yet tough enough. In gender, which Mary Scanlon referred to in her speech, noted that over the last 20 years, UK governments have advocated encouraging private employers to adopt best practice rather than requiring them to take action. And perhaps we do need to be a bit tougher on that. And I wonder if the Minister would suggest whether if the Scottish Government uh, was independent, it would actually take a statutory approach uh, if it had those powers. Now, one of the contributors to the radio programme yesterday uh, was a 27-year-old woman who argued that sexism today was worse than it had ever been. Now, as somebody who is considerably older, I would not agree. I think sexism was even worse when I was young. Uh, but we haven't made the strides I would have thought we might have been able to make over the last nearly 60 years. Uh, after all, 100 years ago, women didn't even have the vote and had no right to employment after marriage. And I think the fact that we've got such a long way, uh, fair way to go uh, is disappointing in that time. But I do think I agree with others who have said it's about attitudes. It's about society's attitudes to women. It's not about who legislates and where. It's much deeper, and much more fundamental than that. And I think that is demonstrated in the report of women on women in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, called Tapping All Our Talent Talents. That was commissioned by the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 2012, chaired by the eminent astrophysicist Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And this report advises that there are 56,000 female graduates in STEM subjects in Scotland of working age, including me, but only 27% of them are using their qualifications to work in STEM subjects, and that compares to 52% of male graduates. And in 20, 2009, there were some 11,000 female graduates in STEM subjects in Scotland uh, who were un unemployed or economically inactive. But these are people of working age. Well, what a waste both of talent and indeed a waste of expensive training, because the STEM subjects are not cheap to educate people in. I, maybe the Minister has a more up-to-date figure than this from five years ago, and I'd, I'd be interested to learn if there has been any progress in reducing this figure. And that report also demonstrated, uh, and again this, uh, parallels what Rhoda Grant was saying in her speech, that the more we went up the ladder in STEM subjects, the less represented women were. So at the top levels, as uh, professors, heads of research institutes, women were even less represented. 
And the report made a number of recommendations to the Scottish Government, uh, and I wonder if the Minister could update those on which he has not referred to already, because Shona Robeson came to a, a, a meeting in April 2013 and appeared to want to take on board the, the recommendations, so I wondered how they're getting on. One of them was a national strategy for Scotland to address occupational segregation, and that, in particular, its impact on STEM subjects. The other was the use of procurement to ensure that contractors and suppliers met the public sector equality duty. I don't think we quite did that in the recent re legislation. The Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, sorry, has referred to the introduction of statutory pay audits, which was part of that report, uh, and a requirement on public bodies and agencies to produce plans to close the gender payback within an agreed timescale. And they also wanted to see more gender disagre disaggregated data. The, the report wanted adequate resourcing for initiatives which have demonstrated su success in tackling occupational segregation. And it wanted a requirement on all Scottish universities to bring their STEM departments up to the Athena Swan Silver Standard within two years. It also wanted legislation similar to that in Spain in 20, uh, 2011, passed uh, by in Spain in 2011, on gender balance and a requirement for universities and research institutes to adopt gender equality plans and also the integration of gender issues into the curricula. Now, all those recommendations could be taken forward now within the existing powers. So I hope that when we return to Parliament after the referendum is over, that there will be determined a determination not to blame others for the barriers women face, still face in employment in Scotland, but to press ahead with the actions that we can take here and now to remove those boundaries, both with the powers we now have and with those further powers which indubitably will be devolved to this Parliament in the future. And I do look forward to the further devolution of those powers. Thank you very much. And to now call Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, President Officer. Uh, we're having this debate at a time when the female employment numbers in Scotland at one and a quarter million are the highest they've ever been. Probably more significantly, the employment rates for women are higher in Scotland than in the other countries of the UK, and the corresponding unemployment and inactivity rates are lower. In the last year alone, female employment numbers have gone up by about 36,000 meaning these are the best set of figures for women at work in Scotland for over 20 years. These figures are now helping to push Scotland's GDP to around £28,000 per person, and this is also about 10% higher than what it is in the UK. This is fantastic news for Scotland, despite the gloom of economic depression that has prevailed over us for some years now. If we take a look and see what the various reasons for this are, we will see a number of policy decisions and initiatives taken in Scotland that are all contributing to the very positive figures that we have. The first ever Women's Employment Summit was held in 2013 in partnership with the STUC and examined many of the barriers facing women who want to work. It will be no surprise that issues like occupational segregation, childcare and vocational routes for women into work, particularly in science and engineering, featured amongst those where some attention had to be focused. Funding projects like Women Into Work to examine progression routes and outcomes for women and extending the Youth Employment Scotland Fund to help employers take on youngsters and younger mums in particular who would otherwise find it difficult to get into work are all helping. The Modern Apprenticeship Programme has seen a huge jump in the numbers of women participating. We are now seeing over 40% of those being taken up by women compared to under 30% in 2008 a very significant and positive change indeed. Encouraging women to become entrepreneurs is another, another area that came out of the summit, and there are quite a range of initiatives to encourage more of this. According to the Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship, if the numbers of female entrepreneurs in Scotland match the numbers of men, we could see another £7 billion added to the Scottish economy. The Scottish Government has put up £1 million towards schemes like Young Age, power of youth, investing women and others, and will hopefully see new businesses emerging led by women to give Scotland's economy that additional boost. Our government is also tackling occupational segregation, which sees many younger women not choosing vocational pathways to work, particularly engineering. Four and a half million pounds was announced by the Cabinet Secretary in June to help encourage more women into the STEM areas of science, technology, engineering and mathematics. We fund the Scottish Resource Centre for Women and CareerWise Scotland, both aimed at attracting more young women into science, and this will be further developed 
by the recently announced Engineering Skills Investment Plan. President officer, I think if we can also intervene as early as possible, even at nursery and primary school level, to put an additional focus on encouraging younger girls to be interested in science, we will reap the rewards later. Often, by the time youngsters get to secondary school, it can be too late. Gender stereotyping often reinforces the belief that science and engineering are oily rag activities only for the boys, and this is very difficult for young women to overcome. If we intervene earlier and show the reality and rewards of careers in science and engineering, especially for women, we stand a much better chance and all of those efforts will have been worthwhile. Can I mention at this stage the Kilmarnock Engineering and Science Society that has been up and running now for a few years, specifically offering lectures to school pupils and often delivered by women who have reached the top in the world of science and engineering and who have never seen an oily rag once in their working lives. President officer, perhaps the, biggest, the other biggest factors in getting more women into work is in how we support childcare and how we get more flexibility into childcare. And also, what kind of welfare and benefit system we have in place for the poorest people in our society. Because we know that women who are single parents are hardest hit if governments get these wrong. The Scottish Government has made significant improvements to childcare since 2007 and from this month all three and four year olds and vulnerable two year olds will get 600 hours of free childcare each year. It will benefit 120,000 children and saves their families about £700 a year. The further transformation that will really see a major change to 1140 hours of free childcare in Scotland, equivalent to a whole primary school year requires control over our own tax and revenues to deliver this. Make no mistake, this isn't just about upping the numbers and grafting them on to our current existing, where many, existing system where many women work part-time and suffer pay discrimination. This is an offer to fundamentally change how childcare works in Scotland that will allow many thousands of Scottish women to fully participate in our economy on an equal footing. In terms of the benefits system, we know that it's Scotland's women who bear the brunt of these cuts being imposed by the UK. It is single female households that lose out the most as a result of UK welfare reforms. Child benefit has been frozen, the reduction in childcare costs covered by working tax credits, the baby element removed from child tax credits, and, and on the list goes. That's why it was a total disgrace when Scottish Labour MPs like Alistair Darling and nine female Scottish Labour MPs voted with the Tories to cap welfare spending, knowing that Scotland's women would suffer the most. Yeah. Presiding officer, Scotland's women deserve better than what they've had to put up with in the UK for years. The Scottish Government has made significant improvements to the lives of women in Scotland, and with the additional powers of independence, we can completely transform childcare and tackle gender inequalities. We can help more women into business and industry, and we can protect the poorest women in our country by making sure our welfare system is fairer and doesn't impoverish our families. That's the prize waiting after independence, and I believe that Scotland's women will back this positive change in Scottish society. All they have to do is to say yes in September 18th. Thank you. Thank you. We now turn to closing speeches and I call on Alison McInnes. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, President Officer, I ask MSPs to reflect on something for just a moment. What if the Cabinet Secretary had spent even just a fraction of the energy she's expended over the years railing against the UK Government on actually challenging our own Cabinet colleagues to live up to our ambitions? If only. It's so often the case with the SNP, they prefer posturing to progress. So I'd like to take a moment to further compare the SNP's dismal record on increasing opportunities for women within the powers that they've already got to the positive strides that have been made by Liberal Democrats and the UK government. We have given more than two million Scots on low and middle income a £700 tax cut. 224,000 of the lowest paid many of whom are women, have been lifted out of paying income tax altogether. But the White Paper revealed taxpayers in an independent Scotland would pay £400 more each year 
compared to our plans to further increase the threshold to 12,500. The Liberal Democrats, I've got a lot to tell you. The Liberal Democrats pension minister, Steve Webb, is overseeing the introduction of the new single tier pension in 2016. It will address historical inequalities by improving state pension income for those with little or no additional state pension. Again, predominantly women. The Liberal Democrat employment minister, Joe Swinson, has championed shared parental leave. From 2015, parents will be able to mix and match their time off with their baby. They will be able to take leave together and both be around during the precious early weeks. Going back to work for a short time to maintain skills and confidence will also be an option. This new flexibility will help overcome outdated stereotypes about who does what. And more importantly, it will enable parents to decide how best to share their responsibilities and manage their career and family lives. It's great news for mums and dads, and even better news for the children who will have the chance of a better start in life. Liberal Democrats have also worked hard to increase diversity at the top of our workforce and to promote gender equality on the boards of listed companies. Women now account for 21% of total directorships, up from 12% in 2010. One in five FTSE 100 boards were all male in 2011. Now, 99% have at least one female director on their boards. And I'm sure members will agree that that is quite a turnaround in a short space of time, although there is much to do. And we are determined to make it a legal requirement for companies employing more than 250 people to publish the average pay of their male and female workers. This will create pressure from staff and customers to afford women the same opportunity as their male colleagues and reward them accordingly not 20% less. So pressure to close the gender pay gap and deliver real equality in the workplace. These radical progressive income and workplace policies have already made a real difference to the lives of millions of women here in Scotland. And furthermore, they remind us that Scotland has so much more to gain by continuing to work with the rest of the UK, not least because of the economic stability that we have secured. Stability that underpins the positive employment figures we are discussing today. Only four years ago, we were teetering on the edge of a financial precipice. Now, our economy is growing. We are making real progress on reducing the deficit, and the outlook for growth and jobs is positive. And why is this hard-earned progress so important? Because prosperity is key to unlocking opportunities. Because when economies experience difficulties, it is consistently women who are hardest hit. And that's why I worry about the impact of six billion in additional cuts that the IFS anticipates an independent Scotland would have to implement. I worry about the implications for women, as should you, who are more likely to be low paid or in part time jobs. Mr. And Brody. I worry about the implication for women who are more likely to be reliant upon the state, the support that the state can currently provide pensioners, parents and carers. A strong Scottish Parliament within the United Kingdom gives us the best of both worlds. It enables us to spread the risks and share the rewards, and it comes with the guarantee of more powers without losing the backup of being part of the larger UK economy. Presiding officer, I would like to end on a conciliatory note. During the course of this referendum campaign, I've had the benefit of speaking to many women on both sides for whom this debate is their first foray into politics. Women who realise that this is the most important political decision we will ever take, an irreversible decision, Women who I hope will continue to engage and enrich our policies and, and our politics and public life in the future. I also welcome that the referendum has renewed this Parliament's focus upon dismantling the stubborn, archaic barriers that women face. But I just sincerely hope that regardless of the outcome next month, we can constructively, collectively tackle these with the same level of passion and determination that's been displayed this afternoon. Thank you. And I call in Les Smith. Seven minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I think there have been some very interesting uh, points raised in this debate, and I think it's very appropriate that the main focus, as we do debate the politics of the referendum, uh, are about the key policy issues, uh, which will not only boost the number of women uh, in the workforce, but also raise the quality uh, of their skill set and the attractiveness uh, to them off the labour market. I think these are the key things just as much as the actual numbers involved. And it goes without saying, as many members have uh, said this afternoon, that women are a crucial part of the labour market uh, because they bring very specific skills in many cases, many of which can be offered on a much more flexible basis uh, than their male uh, counterparts. 
And whilst uh, there have been very considerable differences of opinion this afternoon, I, I think there are some important areas of agreement. Firstly, I think there is no question that good quality education and training uh, are the absolute key. And we know from the contributions of several uh, members this afternoon that the value of apprenticeships is, uh, is, is immense uh, and also uh, many of the themes which underpin uh, the Wood Commission uh, are so important in driving forward uh, policy. In particular, I think there is a growing need to address uh, the STEM subjects and uh, Christine Graham, which is not uh, in the chamber just now, uh, and Willie Coffey have both said uh, very important things about uh, STEM subjects and the difficulties that are encountered uh, by science and the uh, technology industries in attracting uh, sufficient women. Uh, notwithstanding some of the successes in programmes like Girls into Energy, which is sponsored uh, by Shell UK, I, I think if we have a look at the SQA returns uh, over uh, recent school sessions, there remain concerns about the drop in numbers uh, taking subjects like physics, where in the last five school sessions uh, there has been a problem. In mathematics, where numbers have remained largely unchanged for boys, that is not the case for girls. Again, there's been a very significant uh, drop in the last few sessions. And at this point, can I also flag up some concerns about the Scottish baccalaureate exams, which I believe uh, fundamentally have the potential uh, to do something about this trend. I think at the moment we have an exceedingly low take-up rate uh, for the Scottish baccalaureate. Indeed, uh, it actually fell. We've only got 136 entries across the whole of Scotland uh, for this uh, session. And the Cabinet Secretary said in a parliamentary answer to me uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago that the Scottish Baccalaureate was never intended to be a high uptake award since it was primarily in place to meet the needs of our most able learners. And I question the wisdom of saying that because I think the whole point about baccalaureate exams is their interdisciplinary approach, most especially when it comes to dissertation work and practical disciplines. And these are the, exactly the skills that we hear many employers are looking for in their STEM graduates. The whole premise of the baccalaureate discipline is to have added value on that interdisciplinary uh, front. And I think that's something uh, that we need to think about very carefully. And that's happening al also at the same time where we see subjects like geology coming out of the uh, SQA examination diet altogether. And yet it's one of the burgeoning uh, disciplines when it comes to Scotland's thriving technology industries. So I think there are serious issues there. We need to do much more on the training uh, aspect, uh, which we all agree is so important to women in the labour market. Secondly, I think we've had some common agreement uh, that many women are looking for much greater flexibility in the labour market. And that, after all, is the reason why there is cross-party agreement about the need to provide more and better quality uh, childcare. It would, of course, help, I think it was Rhoda Grant who made the point, if the economic modelling that had been done by the Scottish Government uh, had been uh, factually accurate, because it was based on a theoretical trend, uh, not on the specific labour market circumstances that apply uh, to Scotland. So Rhoda Grant was quite correct uh, in pointing out uh, the, the problem of that. Uh, childcare matters in terms of its availability and its reasonable cost, but it also matters in terms of its flexibility. And on this score, I think it's uh, so important that we do something uh, about that availability on the flexible level. Uh, Jane Baxter uh, referred to issues in uh, Mid-Scotland and Fife about this, but you know, we have a, a group of um, campaigners in Glasgow just now uh, who are making the very point that uh, you cannot uh, have the Scottish Government's policy on uh, full childcare provision unless we also harness the private sector availability of these uh, private public partnership mixes in nurseries. It cannot be delivered uh, by the dependence on the state sector. Uh, and I think we also need to ta take on board the fact that in, in some of the state-funded nursery places, they don't have that flexibility because it's only up to three hours uh, a day and in some cases they don't cover school holidays. So I think there's a lot of uh, issues that we need to uh, look at. Finally, I think the third area of relative agreement is the, the, the huge role that colleges uh, have to play in tackling this problem. And one of the great success stories of colleges since the changes that took place in 1992 is their ability to cater for a wide diversity of courses, full-time and part-time, many of which are particularly suitable to women. But as has been made clear this afternoon, it is impossible to come to any other conclusion than the fact that the recent college cuts have disproportionately affected women. And I don't want to hear any excuses about measuring uh, part-time places against full-time equivalent. 
What matters is measuring against the trends of the years of exactly the same uh, measurement uh, further back. And on that basis, the Scottish Government knows that the message is not a good one. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think there are uh, lots of things where we agree on the principles behind the policies that we have to develop uh, to ensure that women are not only uh, much more available in the uh, labour market, but are available on a flexible uh, and on a basis that allows their own uh, uh, individual skills to flourish in a way that perhaps we've not been able uh, to do uh, before. The uh, recent employment and GDP figures uh, make it very clear that Scotland is doing very well as part of the union, benefiting from the combined economic policies of Holyrood and Westminster in a way that Jenny Mara and Alison McInnes have both uh, referred to. It is essential to have these economies of scale that are uh, important to investment and to jobs and which help provide that economic security which allows uh, local economies to develop too. The potential boost in female participation rates is huge providing the whole of that capacity can be stimulated and that's why we will be fully supportive of the unionist amendments in the name of Jenny Mara and Alison McInnes. Many thanks and I now call on Jackie Bailey around eight minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This has been an interesting debate. I've always believed that when women come together across this chamber, we can make a huge difference. I'm, of course, reminded, as I see Angela Constance across the room, that she and Shona Robson were promoted to their current posts a mere four months ago. Um, I congratulated them at the time. They are, of course, very intelligent and capable women, as all women in this Parliament are, but they've always been intelligent and capable women, so one cannot help but wonder why they weren't promoted before this. The suspicion at the time was that this was less to do with recognising talent, it was simply about the referendum. And whilst there will be some cynical people in this room, not me of course, presiding officer, that believe the timing of this debate has more to do with the referendum, I always welcome any opportunity to debate opportunities for women. But you know, to be frank, we need to move away from just debating the issues and the warm words to actually coming up with action. And that action needs to be across a wide range of issues that collectively start to remove the barriers from women's participation, whether it's in education, whether it's in training, employment, family life, or indeed civic life. Scottish Labour has always been motivated by a very deep and abiding belief in gender equality. We have delivered the twinning of parliamentary constituencies to ensure that there were equal numbers of men and women standing as candidates. And that wasn't easy to do, but we delivered 50-50 representation for men and women as Labour MSPs in almost all of the Scottish Parliament elections. And I will work with the other parties to encourage them to do the same. Because, you know, it's not just enough for us to be here, it's what we do that makes a difference. Working across the United Kingdom, it was Labour's progressive politics that delivered the 1970 Equal Pay Act, the 1975 Sex Discrimination Act, the Equality Act of 2010, and much more besides. But when you see, for example, that the gender pay gap remains persistently high, then there is clearly more still to do. But I don't believe it's simply a constitutional issue. I believe it takes political will. So any progress on increasing opportunities for women is absolutely welcome. But my frustration, to be frank, in these past few years has not been characterised by increasing opportunities. It's been characterised by opportunities missed. The reduction in college places, an opportunity missed. The loss of 140,000 college places, as many people have referred to since 2007-8, actually undermines the government's own objective to ensure that we have the training and skills for the long-term needs of our economy. And there is no doubt, as Jenny Meyer pointed out, that this disproportionately impacts on women, with 85,000 women affected. Then there is the payment of the living wage. Now, here was another missed opportunity. The Procurement Reform Bill could have delivered the living wage as part of the £10 billion that is spent each and every year in public sector contracts. They could have delivered that to 400,000 low-paid workers in Scotland. 64% of them are women. 
That's 256,000 working women that the SNP said no to. And there was no action on zero hours contracts, no action on equal pay audits, all things that I know the Cabinet Secretary would acknowledge would have made a positive difference to women. And all things that the SNP said to women, no, you can't have it. And in all these cases, they did actually have the power to do something about it. Now, the Cabinet Secretary, members of the SNP, make great play about not having the powers to do something, as if that's an excuse for not delivering progress. But, you know, progressive politics doesn't need constitutional change. It needs political will. See, when the suffragettes were fighting for votes for women, that was delivered by political will, not constitutional change. When the minimum wage... Well, Order, you know, please. the minister has only recently arrived in the chamber, but is insisting on interrupting from a sedentary position. Excuse me, Ms May Bailey, I would prefer if no one interrupted from a sedentary position, please. Jack Bailey. Thank you very much, presiding officer. The minimum wage that some members of the SNP slept through, helping low-paid women, delivered by political will, not constitutional change. Creating the NHS, helping families across Scotland and the United Kingdom, delivered by political will, not constitutional change. And let me turn to childcare, raised by Mary Scanlon, and let me say it is an economic issue, not a women's issue. This is something you actually have power over now. The government focus on hours at the expense of quality and flexibility, but you know, it doesn't deliver for working families. And there is an inherent dishonesty about the SNP policy when there are no costings for their childcare proposals. They don't appear to have done the modelling and they've certainly not published it. They've delayed the date for childcare provision for vulnerable two-year-olds. And of course, it relies on 104,000 mothers becoming economically active, but guess what? There are only 64,000 mothers that fit the bill. So it just doesn't stack up. 40,000 women posted missing. And I look forward to the SNP policy that encourages more pregnancies to make their sums add up. But there is another area in which the Scottish Government has the power to act now. How about delivering more women in the boardrooms of Scotland's public bodies? Now, about five to six years ago, I'll be corrected on the timescale, the Scottish Government set a target of 40% of applications from women. That's just applications. They failed to meet even that. Less than a third of board members in Scotland are women. Some public bodies have no women at all. And all of these appointments, presiding officer, are made by the Cabinet Secretaries. So why have they not delivered? I'm much more ambitious than just wanting 40% of applications. I want to see bums on seats, which is why Labour is committed to 50-50. I'm just checking I'm allowed to say that. Labour is committed to 50-50 so on that all just checking in the public... Just watch what we say in the chamber, please. <laughs> but Labour is committed to 50-50 on all public boards, and we will act to deliver just that, yeah. because it takes political will, yeah. not constitutional change. <laughs> Presiding officer, I have to say... Chick Brody is a very brave man. He was only one of two men to speak in the debate. Mr Brody talked about the alpha male. Off camera, he was pointing to himself. Let me say as gently as I can to him, that's probably a triumph of hope over experience. His admiration, though, for the talents of women were absolutely evident, and I look forward to him supporting a female First Minister, whichever party that might be from. Um, I think I'm in my final minute, presiding officer. We do have time. Uh, absolutely. Presiding officer, women in Scotland are smart. I think Chick Brody would agree with me on that. But, you know, we need to get beyond the warm words to judge how they should vote in the referendum. They will judge the Scottish Government's record, where they had the power to deliver for women, but decided not to do so. What a missed opportunity. Clearly, the SNP's priority is simply to win women's votes for the referendum. What we want to do is women, win women's votes to actually change their lives. Thank you very much. And I now call on Angela Constance to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until 4.59. 
Thank you, President Officer. Can I say this has been a very consensual debate, and in case you're wondering which debate I've been uh, sitting listening to, what I actually mean is that I think the majority of us agree on the destination. And I suppose where the difference of opinion uh, rests is the route we take and it's the, that journey that we take towards achieving uh, equality. And I've always been of the view that there is nothing inevitable about gaining equality under any political system. But I do think some arrangements are more adept at delivering equality, and I do think some arrangements are just more inherently uh, democratic. And there is a point about who makes decisions and where those decisions are made, as well as how you actually use those powers of independence. And for me, I'm just not pinning my hopes on the right man being in number 10, because to be frank, one, I'm too old for that. And secondly, that just hasn't worked very well for Scotland to date. Because for more than half my lifetime, Scotland has had a Prime Minister in at number 10 that hasn't reflected the democratic will um, of the people in Scotland. Of course. Jackie Bailey. That would be fine if it wasn't for the fact that you actually have the power to make decisions over things like the appointment of women to public boards in Scotland. So given that you have the power, given that you are the one making the decision, why hasn't the number of women increased? Well, of course, uh, you know, the proportion of women on public boards in Scotland um, is at 38%. And yes, we do need to be far more ambitious than that and to achieve that. And it's also this government, unlike the UK government, that uh, took on the public sector equality duty, applied it to the public sector, as we were able to under the Equality Act 2010. We have done that, introduced a suite of measures. Unlike the UK government, we are south of the border. The whole thing just remains uh, on, a, on a voluntary basis. So we are doing what we can within our powers. But the fact is, not just now, Ms Mara, the fact is, no... The fact is, equality, sit down please, the equality remains, remains a matter reserved to the Westminster Government. And I hope that... Uh, Audrey, please, can I stop I you a moment? Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary, can I stop you a moment? If members are not taking an intervention, other members should sit down, but they will be told to do so by the presiding officers if they remain on their, seat, their feet. Cabinet uh, Secretary. Yeah, of course, of course, presiding officer. And I uh, look forward to having support uh, from Jackie Bailey and Miss Mara uh, behind that letter for them to put uh, their shoulders to the wheel and the letter that Shona Robison uh, has sent to the UK government in a moment has said to the UK government, give us the powers over equality now. It will only take six months and that would allow us to make speedy progress after a yes vote because we are ambitious on this side of the parliament and indeed we are impatient and I'm sorry Ms Mara but to say after 44 years of the Equal Pay Act that yes it's some got some time to go, it's got some pace to go, well I think that is a wee bit uh, of uh, an understatement uh, of, of the year. I will take a, an intervention. Jenny Mara. The Cabinet Secretary is so committed to women on public boards. Why is it that her government um, appointed 10 regional college chairs out of 12 appointments. Only two women. This is a matter of public policy and public appointment. Why only two out of 12? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, indeed. And the very important issue about that uh, was certainly in terms of the applications that we received from women. Uh, women outperformed on the basis of those applications. But where there is an issue, and I'm sure uh, that we are united um, about this, is there is much more to be done in terms of ensuring uh, that talented women uh, can uh, progress, they know about to make applications, they're supported uh, in making applications and nobody is disputing that we cannot do more uh, now because I'm always, I'm always up for challenge and debate about what more we can do with our powers and resources. Now, I have no issue with that debate but that does not preclude the need uh, for more powers, more opportunities and for more resources to be coming to this Parliament for us to be de deciding uh, on our own terms how we pursue the equality agenda. 
And if I can say to uh, Jane Baxter uh, and uh, Dr Murray, uh, I'm pleased to inform them that Athena Swan and Universities has went up from being in four universities to 14. Uh, they should, of course, might want to look at the uh, guidance letter from Michael Russell to the, the Scottish Funding Council, which has challenged the name about occupational segregation uh, within courses uh, and, indeed, uh, in their workforce at a senior level. And the issue with regards to the Wood uh, agenda, where the recommendations are that for the first time, uh, the Scottish Funding Council uh, and indeed Skills Development Scotland uh, will have realistic but stretching targets and will have to report annually on that. And we will, of course, uh, presiding officer, uh, come back to Parliament uh, in the autumn to report uh, more fully on that, as we will uh, with the, our uh, consideration of the Working Together review. And before I move on, presiding officer, I also want to thank Rhoda Grant, uh, Christine Graham and others um, for making the mention um, and plugging away uh, for carers and their contribution uh, to the economy. We have to remember uh, that unpaid work makes a huge uh, contribution uh, to our economy. And that unpaid work, um, as pointed out by many the briefings, uh, is indeed uh, provided by women. Presiding officer, I think it's important that we reflect on the gains of devolution. Successive Scottish administrations have helped uh, to narrow that historic gap in performance uh, with the UK uh, across a range of economic indicators, whether it's output, productivity or employment. And our economy is strengthening, and that indeed is good news. But we need to ensure that women... Uh, no, thank you. We need to ensure that women get their fair and rightful share uh, of that economic growth, because that isn't just the right thing to do, it's actually the smart thing to do and the essential thing to do uh, if we are to grow our economy as much as we can. And I agree with Close the Gap that women across Scotland are simply in the wrong jobs or the wrong level of jobs with respect to their skills and talents. But of course, as well as doing more, we do indeed need the powers of independence. And what I want to see hey, hey. in the Scotland that I seek is investment-led recovery as opposed to Westminster-led austerity. We have responsibility for educating and training the current and future workforce, but our powers become far more limited in terms of getting people into work and in terms of people's treatment uh, once they are in work. The UK has one of the most unequal and unbalanced economies. Uh, and, you know, we, as I pointed out in the publication that I published a few days ago, we have to ensure that we get the right type of growth and that everyone gets access to that. And of course, uh, presiding officer, we spent much time uh, talking about transformational childcare. And that is indeed the absolute game changer. And it is yeah. good to know that we have the support uh, of leading economists who have advised uh, previous Scottish administrations uh, of different uh, political perspectives. Because it doesn't take an economist to know that the biggest barrier to women getting into work and to progressing into work is access to affordable and indeed uh, flexible ch childcare. I'll take Ms Smith. Well, Smith, uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary. And it, it is about the flexibility issue. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary is quite right on that. But would, would she agree that when it comes to the childcare issue, that the most important thing that can be delivered is that that policy is predicated on the accurate statistics in terms of the women who will go back into the workforce. The Scottish Government's figures are simply not accurate. Absolutely not. Our figures are sound. And as I explained to your colleague, Ms Scanlon, uh, earlier on in the debate, what the opposition repeatedly uh, misinterpret or misunderstand, I'm sure they've got their own uh, reasons uh, for that, fail to miss out that every year 50,000 children are born in Scotland and this we have to take that into account as we progress forward and women just now are lost to the labour market uh, forever and when you look at the labour market participation uh, rates of women in relation to the age of their children um, even when their children are well into their school years that participation rate does not pick up in the way it should but the key thing about transformational childcare is that successive Westminster governments, despite having control over tax, welfare, the economy, have just never delivered universal uh, childcare. 
and many people on this side of the chamber I know are sincere in their aspiration and they have campaigned for universal childcare all their political lives. But this, no thank you, this isn't just about campaigning, this is about delivering. We are committed to a managed expansion yeah, and yeah, with the yeah. powers that we have, right. we've increased childcare, free childcare by 45 per cent and yeah, that's a good yeah. record and of course we will do more with independence because with independence we will be yeah. able to pay for universal childcare, yeah. something, something that successive, successive UK governments have failed to prioritise and indeed have failed to fund. And if I could just briefly mention Scottish Labour's five-point plan for women. Much of it is worthy, although some of it in terms of childcare is far less ambitious uh, than what the Scottish Government is setting out. And Jackie Bailey spoke about issues for women and equality. It's about political will. It is about political will, but why does she insist on in asking permission from Westminster? Because everyone, everyone, everyone of Scottish Labour's five-point plan for women is currently a reserve power and she will, no yes. thank you, she, I'm running out of time, she will rely, she will rely on the right man being in at number one. 10. And I know Ms Constance, Minister, Cabinet Secretary, I have a point of order, I need to stop you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My point of order relates to the accuracy of what the Cabinet Secretary is saying. And she Ms. Bailey, Ms. Bailey, has sit not down. Read Ms. Bailey, sit the down. Pledges. Ms. Bailey, you're well aware you've been here long enough to know that what is said in this chamber is neither a point of order nor is it a matter for me, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I've examined that five point plan from Labour carefully, Scottish Labour's plan. And yes, I'm all for political will. What I'm not for is asking permission from Westminster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we need to look, we need to look at the lack of progress by Westminster governments, their lack of progress in low pay, their lack of progress uh, on equal pay. Well, I have to say, presiding officer, Westminster has had their chance yeah, because yeah. at best, at best, they're holding us back and at worst, they're taking us back in time. And if we look, Ms McGuinness, at the worst you aspects need to wind up. of welfare reform, £4 billion pounds of cuts, welfare reform cuts uh, in Scotland, oh, and £2.8 billion of those affect women in Scotland. You should hang your head in shame before you come into this parliament and teach to us about protecting I think you're finished, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. That concludes the debate on increasing opportunities for women. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 10833 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wish to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10833. No members asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 10833 in the name of Patrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 10837 in the name of Joe Patrick. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage one timetable for the Community Impairment Scotland Bill, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Patrick to move motion number 10837. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 10837, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motions number 10834 to 10836 on approval of SSI's on block. The question on these motions will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members in relation to the debate for increasing opportunities for women, if the amendment in the name of Jenny Mara is agreed, the amendment in the name of Alice McInnes falls? The first question then is amendment number 10829.3 in the name of Jenny Mara, which seeks to amend motion number 10829 in the name of Angel Conson on increasing opportunities for women be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 10829.3 in the name of Jenny Mara is as follows. Yes, 37. No, 58. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I can also remind members that in relation to the debate on increasing opportunity for women, if the amendment in the name of Mary Scanlon is agreed, the amendment in the name of Alice McInnes falls. The next question then is amendment number 10829.2 in the name of Mary Scanlon, which seeks to amend motion number 10829 in the name of Angela Constance on increasing opportunities for women be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10829.2 in the name of Mary Scanlon is as follows. Yes, 14. No, 81. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10829.1 in the name of Alice McInnes, which seeks to amend motion number 10829 in the name of Angela Constance on increasing opportunities for women be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10829.1 in the name of Alice McInnes is as follows. Yes, 18. No, 81. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion number 10829 in the name of Angela Constance on increasing opportunities for women be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10829 in the name of Angela Constance is as follows. Yes, 58. No, 41. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. I propose to ask a single question on motion numbers 10834 to 10836 on approval of SSIs. If any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. There's no objection. So the next question is at motions number 10834 to 10835 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of SSIs be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motions are therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.